Okay, well, that was a special uh, number. I like that that number. Yeah, I mean, I didn't I didn't tell her what my topic gonna be, but she it was just right on my topic there. So, um, let us worship Christ our Lord. That is just the theme of my uh, uh, our study for this morning. Um, and also, I like the song that uh, the the priest team sing, "Amazing Love." Yeah. It's my joy to honor you. So um, I got my stress ball here because I know I get, I get stressed out when I talk. So it will it will help me keep my uh, butterflies. <laughs> so anyway, um, you can see the title of my uh, sermon is on the top there. Uh, it's going to be based on Revelation 14, uh, just two verses, six and seven. So I'm going to start with a couple of amazing facts. Um, according to Orkin, you know who Orkin is, right? Everybody knows what. What's Orkin? Okay. Orkin, New York City is the number two rat-infested, pastor knows it, <laughs> number two rat-infested in the United States, city of the United States. Do you know, guys, know what's number one? <gasps> he knows it. Windy City. So I thought it must be interesting to know. <laughs> so if you guys go to a hotel in Chicago, just, just watch out. <laughs> so anyway, um... In New York City, 2013, they, they have tried different ways to, 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 to deal with this rat infestation. You know, they have tried, um, they have tried um, baits and traps and, you know, they have these ultrasonic uh, devices. It didn't work. So what they did was they, they create a um, chemical that this chemical would induce menopause to the rats, female rats. So it worked. And uh, they were pretty successful. Um, they actually, you know, uh, lowered down the, the rates of the rat infestation. That's on the other end. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have, I don't know if you guys have heard this, there are what we call holy rats in India. Okay, so I'm going to gross you out. So. <laughs> Anyway, these holy rats in India. Now, now, India, as you know, they're 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 Hindu country, so they, they believe in reincarnation. So, however, India suffered millions of dollars of losses in economy due to rat infestation. Number one, infrastructure damage. The, the rats, the the rats, their teeth grow throughout their lifetime. So, as they get older, they have to bite on harder things, such as plastics, wood, electrical wires, and you know all kinds of hard stuff to trim their teeth down. So they have a lot of infrastructure damage. They also have losses in agricultural products. So as you know, when rats, they just devour all these crops, all this agricultural stuff. And of course, they have health problems. As you know, the rats are, they call them reservoir of parasites. So they just carry all kinds of disease. So anyway, this, that's, that's the bad side, okay, of what the rats do. Now, on the other side, they have a Hindu temple in northern India that is dedicated to rat worship. Oh, yeah. Okay. And you can actually Google this. They have YouTube pictures. They have YouTube videos. You can actually see, I mean, uh, rats scrolling all over. So this temple is made up of beautiful marble facade with solid silver doors right in front. And throughout the church, throughout the temple, they have panels of legends of their goddess. Now, they have estimated that this temple has contains between 20 to 25,000 rats. And these are called what we call, they are black rats. Because we have, in the Asia, we have brown rats. In, in India, they have black rats. Now, these 25,000 rats they are, some of them are called, they are, are white rats, they're called albino. And these white rats are supposed to be special. So these white rats are, if you see one, if you touch one, that is supposed to be a special blessing. Your dream is supposed to come true. So they say that worshipers all over the country, they travel at great distance to be able to come and worship at this temple. And so when they come in, they take their sandals off because it's a holy place, okay? Now, the church 
opens at 4 o'clock a.m., being initiated by a, a high priest. Now, this high priest would offer food to all these rats that are crawling all over the temple. Okay? So they said that eating food that has been nibbled on by rats is considered a high honor. Okay? <laughs> the most devoted worshiper will drink from the bowl will rats play and bathe in. Some even sleep in the temple, allowing the rats to crawl all over them. So the people, the worshipers, they don't call them rats. They call them kabas, meaning little children in India. And they believe to be that these are descendants of the goddess that, that reincarnated into the rats. So they also say that when these rats die, they would become humans. They would become you and me. So they say, so if you kill a rat, if you, by, by accident, if you step on one of them and you kill them, there's going to be a big fine. So, you know, people have to be careful, you know, that they don't step on these rats. And, you know, 25,000, that's a lot of rats. So, so that's, you know, now I tell you this story because it's amazing that in any culture throughout history, man will go out at great length to be able to worship. Okay? Man is hardwired for worship. Sadly, worship has been warped in so many ways. So that's my, I um, just want to get your attention on that one. So anyway, the, I'm going to tell you the story of Matt Redman, um, a popular Christian singer, uh, composer. There was a time in late 1990s where they, they could not create a song. They have a hard time, you know, trying to compose a song. So one day, while they were practicing, the church pastor came in and said, well, let's practice this, you know. We can't, we can't create a song, so what we'll do is we'll try this. No bands, no music, no microphone, no light, no sound system. So they tried this. And so what they did was, for a few months, what they did was just they come to the church, they would pray, they would sing hymns, and they would read the Bible. And after a while, they would come up to the song, Heart of Worship. And the song goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote some of the words of the song. It says, when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you. So for a while, they have no, they have no background. They have nothing, just their voices. And then slowly, they introduce back their bands and their instruments and the lights and the sound system. So the point of the story is that the, the worship is has to come from the heart. If it's, if it's just external, if it's just physical, it's not going to work. And God, you know, you can fool people, but you cannot fool God. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, the Lord, for this morning. As we study your word, continue to open our eyes. Humble us, dear Lord, with your spirit. Make us teachable. Make us humble. Flood this place, dear Lord, with your spirit that we may have a better glimpse of you and better have a picture, better picture of you, dear Lord. In that way, we can worship you from our hearts. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to... Um, my, uh, our study would be Revelation 14, 6, and 7. Um, worship, worship of a hyper-relational God. So um, I'm going to give you a definition of worship, Okay. Um, it's rather a lengthy definition, but we will unpack this as we, as we go along. So worth, worship comes from the word worth-ship. That means the value of a person, value of, what, of something or somebody. So it says, an active response to the character, words, and action of God, initiated by his re revelation and enabled by his redemption, whereby the mind is transformed, the heart is renewed, and action surrendered in all accordance with his will and in order to declare his infinite wisdom. So basically, it says, in short, it says we want an accurate picture of God. 
And if you look at the temple services in the Old Testament, that's what it's all about. You know, forget the furniture, forget all the stuff. Everything points to Jesus. Um, Eric Sontara, uh, you know the story of Eric Sontara. He was, she was, she, had, she was quadriplegic, and um, in her in her wedding wedding day, you know, they they have a plan to, you know, she was trying to get ready for the grand entrance, as she was trying to, as as she was preparing for the grand entrance, two incidents happened. First was she rolled over her beautiful gown and make a big spot and make a tear in it. And then the flowers on her lap slipped and slipped and had lodged between her leg and the chair. So she was filled with disappointment. So she didn't know what to do. I mean, you know, the wedding was here and she was, you know, she was trying to think what to do. Then all of a sudden the door swung open and all she can see was her husband. And she said, once I saw Ken's face, all I can think of him, all I can think of was him. Everything else, the people in the church, the flowers that were sitting in, the, in my lap, the fact that my dress didn't fall right because I was sitting in a wheelchair, the grease marks, the rip in my gown, all of it paled in comparison. And she said, when we see Christ, he will be all that matters to us. Amen. My friends, worship always starts with God. Always centered on God. Always about God. Never about you. Never about me. Never about the music. Um, so, and Augustine said this, Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. So let's examine this, this worship thing. You know, it, 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 we talk so much about this. Um, it is the most important subject, I think, in the, in the scriptures. Okay? It is probably the most complex, deep topic in the Bible and Today, we're just going to barely scratch the surface. And this worship thing has caused so much division. It has caused so much conflict, debate in churches. And so the question is, why is it, why is it important to study worship? Why do we need to study this topic? Well, first of all, what was the reason of Lucifer's fall? As you can see, the issue is worship. What was the issue of man's fall? It's not about an apple. It's not about the fruit. It's all about worship. The first murder, let's take for example the first murder, it's not about a vegetable versus meat. It's all about worship. You look at the Exodus, it's all about worship so they can migrate and worship their God. And yet they worship other gods. You look at the kings of Israel, the United Kingdom, divided kingdom, the divided kingdom, they have 20 kings each. Northern kingdom, they're all bad kings. By the way, the kings in the in Israelites, they were considered, they are classified into three. The good, the bad, and the in-between. The in-between means they've done good and bad. So northern kingdom, 20 kings, they're all bad kings, worship idols. Southern kingdom, they're all bad except for four good kings that didn't worship the idol. So it's all about worship. You look at the books of the Bible, like Daniel. Daniel is all about worship. Esther is about worship. Psalms, oh, there's so much worship there. Job, you look at Job, it's all about worship. Job had a warped view of God and he got corrected. Revelation is all about worship. You look at the dark ages, why was there dark ages? It's all about worship. And finally, what are we going to do in heaven? We're going to be building kingdoms, but primarily we're going to be worship. So my friend, it's very important that we talk about this worship thing. Um, you know, worship can be lost upon us when repeated so many times. Sometimes we go into an intellectual autopilot or cruise control. It becomes mechanical rather than spiritual. You know, I grew up as a janitor in the church. And um, throughout my uh, younger life, you know, we, we spent so much time in the janitorial work. And um, my mother, who is here... <laughs> She's the, she's the spiritual stronghold of, of our family. She was first in faith. And, you know, the first thing she would do in the morning is turn the lights on, everything, 4 o'clock a.m., turn the lights on, and she would do stuff, you know, little stuff. And the first thing, then the next thing I would hear is that she would say, worship, worship, worship. And 
you know, I was thankful for her for that, because if not for that, I would, you know, where would I be? But you know what? After a while, you know, there was a time in my life where worship was become a stern obligation. I did it because I was afraid of her. I, it was a fear. It was, there was no appreciation of worship. At, there was a time in my life. It became a duty instead of a delight. It became pressure instead of pleasure. It became a responsibility instead of a response. It was more of a performance rather than a participation. The question is, why does God need to be worshipped? Does God cease to be God when we don't worship him? Amen. And you look at Luke 19.40. You know, God says, if they keep quiet. The story is, you know, the disciples were trying to quiet down the, the praises for God. And, and God said, no, don't keep them quiet. Because if you keep them quiet, even the stones will cry out. So, my friend, God doesn't need a worship, but he makes he longs for it because he wants a relationship with us. And when we, and so Brad Pitt, um, our popular actor, you know, he, he quoted this. He said, I don't, I don't understand this idea of a God who says, you have to acknowledge me. You have to say that I'm the best and then I'll give you eternal happiness. If you won't, then you don't get it. It seemed to me about ego. I can't see God operating from an ego. So it made no sense to me. Now, Brad Pitt grew up from a Calvinistic family. Um, Christians, you know, but Cal from a Cal Calvinistic point of view. So he, he just disregarded his parents' teaching. And so the question is, how do we respond when people say this? God, is God egotistic? Does God require praises to be God? My friend, the problem is, our worship is determined by our perspective of God. You know, when we don't fully understand the character of the glory of God and human, our human, our utter helplessness will never get to the heart of worship. I'll tell you the story of the, uh, you guys heard the story of the 12 boys in Thailand, cave rescue. Um, they were found nine days, is it nine days or 10 days? Nine days without food, without water, without light. And do you think they understand their outer helplessness? You know, they were given three options. One option is to drill from the top of the mountain, and hopefully they'll pull them out. That's what they did in Chile Miners uh, incident. It's kind of a risky, but it's so-so. It's not bad, it's not good. The second option was they're gonna wait a few months for the flood season to come down, and then they could, it would be you know, four, five, six months. So it's a, it's, safe, it's a safe rescue operation, but it's a long one, and we don't know what's gonna happen to these boys. The third option was they're going to swim back, dive back, backtrack to the entrance, to the entry point, which is about six miles. And these people, these kids are not even, they can't even swim. Much more so, you know, expect them diving underwater. And in fact, a veteran died trying to save them. So what they did was, you, you've seen the videos where they have to be, they have to consent to be sedated, they have to be put to sleep, they have to be put in, sealed in a stretcher, and they have to have full face mask with oxygen pump. And so, my friends, you and I are born in this cave of sin. God, in all of his glory, provided a rescue operation to be sedated. We need to be sedated. We have to consent, yes, Lord, I want you to sedate me from our sinfulness and be given that oxygen, the breath of life. Amen. Once we realize our condition, our utter helplessness, and God's character of love, we cannot do no other thing but worship. These 12 boys, they have the freedom to say, no, we don't want to be sedated, you know. But that would be foolish, would it? Same thing with us, my friend. You know, God has, you know, all God says was, just ask, I'll give it to you. And that's all we need to do, just ask. John Piper quotes this, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. You know, Johann Sebastian Bach was a pop famous uh, music composer. And um, 
He said that all music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and soul's refreshment. You know, when, when Bach would compose a song, he would put JJ on top. JJ, and that means Yeso Juva. That means Jesus help me. So in all of his composition, he always say, Lord, I need your help. And at the end of his composition, he would write down SDG. And you can see this, I mean, if you go to online, if you Google this, you can see this SDG. That's his signature on the bottom of the composition. And SDG stands for Sole Deo Gloria. That means to God alone be the glory. He never take credit for his work. Always everything points to God. And I hope that would be our attitude in whatever we say and do. So let's go to the motivations of worship. Number one is relationship. I think I have it in, my, uh, in the board. Relationship. Um, verse 6, uh, part B, it says, To those who live on the earth, nation, tribe, language, and people. So God wants to communicate with us. God wants to say something to us. He wants to proclaim something to us. So that is, God wants to have a relationship with us. Josh McDowell, who is a popular preacher, he said this, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Um, there's a story of a lieutenant in Fort Bragg. You know, he was, he was in a convenience store, and as he was buying, you know, chips and whatever he was buying, he recognized, he realized that he ran out of change. So he came out of the store and tried to find somebody who, who's got, you know, little change. So he flagged down a sergeant, and he said, and so as, they, as he flagged down the sergeant, you know, he asked the sergeant, hey, do you have change? And the sergeant replied, um, yeah, hold on, let me see. Maybe I can find some in here. And the lieutenant said, that's not the way to respond to an officer. Let me ask you again. Do you have change? And the sergeant replied, no, sir. So the moral of the story is that Authority without relationship will lead you to nothing. So the three basic types of relationship, you have casual relationship. So casual is just say, hi, hello. You know, where I work, we have a policy that you said, hi, hello, at 10 feet. And you said, you smile at about five feet. So, you know, we have this casual uh, uh, way of greeting people. Now, there's another relationship which is close. A close relationship is, this is where people talk about sports, they talk about recipe, news, talk about cars, people, politics. So this is more of in, um, brain, uh, intellectual conversation. Now the third kind of relationship is communion. So this is where you share your dreams, you share your frustration, you share your tears, and you cry out to this person. That is more of a heart relationship. So my friend, what is our relationship with Jesus? Is it casual? Obviously, we start with God casual, and then we start to develop relationship with God. And hopefully, my prayer is that as we keep growing in our walk with God, we will start to com have communion with God. Not just communication, but a communion where you have a deep and relationship with Jesus. And that's why they call it, uh, when we have our devout Feet washing, we have, it's called a Holy Communion, so it's because you're talking with God. So Webster um, framed this word frenemy. Okay, you've heard this word frenemy. It's an oxymoron of love and hate relationship. And we have, um, I'm sure you guys don't have frenemies at work. Um, there are people that you really don't like at work, but since you work together, you just like them, right? <laughs> and then you have family, you have frenemies, where there's this weird uncle, there's this weird, weird cousin, but they're family, so, you know, we deal with them, right? And the third one is in church. Oh, it, it doesn't happen here, right? It just happens in other churches. But it, it, you know, we have frenemies everywhere. So do we treat God as our frenemy? Is God our frenemy? In a way, it, it is um, one sense, in one sense because when we were still enemies with God, God had already saved us. God was became, became our friend. 
So in a way, that's a frenemy relationship. Or is our relationship with God more parasitic? You know, parasitic is just you're just trying to get good stuff from God. You know, give me this, God, give me this. And then, then we'll be okay. Or do we have a relationship with God where it's a vending machine? A vending machine type of relationship is when you put your little prayers, where you put your little Bible reading, and you expect good things. If the bad things come out, then we get disappointed with God. So my friends, God is always wants a relationship with us. Now I will tell you this, God is a hyper-relational God. If you forget anything about my sermon, that's okay, but just don't forget, God is a hyper-relational God. Now, why did I say hyper-relational God? God is hyper-relational in a sense that not in a sense of restlessness, not in a sense of super active child with ADD, or not in any kind of disorganized um, hyperactivity, but hyper-relationship in a sense that he is over and beyond what our normal relationships can handle. You take, for example, the story of the prodigal son. You know, it's been told over and over again, but I think the point, the one thing that most people missed in the story of the prodigal son is that while the son was walking slowly towards his father, as the father was seeing him, the father was running. I mean, can you imagine that love? You know, you know, friends, in our work, in our walk with Jesus, God is running towards us. God wants, you know, like, come on, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, we're like mules, you know, it's like trying to pull a mule, come on. So God is running towards us while we are walking with God. What a love, amazing love. So God longed to have a relationship with us, you and me, and that is his nature. Now, since you and I are majestic creature of the divine image of God, we are made capable of receiving and giving love. We too, each one of us, wants to be an object of affection, love, and desire, right? All of us have insatiable hunger for a love relationship. Therefore, you and me and God are a perfect match. And you know, this perfect match is only demonstrated in true worship. Let's like to, uh, take for a look, for example, the uh, Samaritan woman in John 4, 7. You know, here God depicts a hyper-relational God who is willing to have an interaction and socialization with a woman in spite of the cultural practice of that time. You know, brothers and sisters, God doesn't care where you've been. God doesn't care what you've been through. You know, all of us, if not 99%, if not all of us, have been emotionally wounded in the past. And I can guarantee you that unless you have a perfect family or perfect friend or perfect relationship, and sometimes it is the people that we trusted would hurt us. And it's a little ironic, but that is the truth. And so when we have personal baggage that we carry in life, we tend to be protective of ourselves, and that makes us incapable of loving. It, that makes us incapable of having a higher kind of relationship with God. When we become damaged goods, we tend to be, we tend to safeguard ourselves. And the more pain we we are, the more pain we are given, the more we protect ourselves. So this is the condition of the woman at the well. The woman at the well had five husbands, and all these husbands were no good husbands. But you know, this woman at the well, she was a majestic creature, but tainted by emotional baggage of failures. All her relationships were all failures. And she feels that there is no worth. And um, as Jesus was engaging with this woman at the well, she started to open up. You know, a rosebud, if you look at a rosebud, you can't open a rosebud with a pliers or some kind of invasive tool. You have to, have, to, have to allow rosebud to open up 
through nature, that is the rain, water, sunshine, nutrients from, from the ground. So that is how God deals with this woman. It has to be gentle. You cannot pry out. Sometimes what we do is we use the Bible to pry people out of their sins. You know, we try to do that sometimes. And, and God was saying to this woman, I am thirsty, but you are thirsty too. I am thirsty of H2O, but you are thirsty of H2O, different kind of H2O. And that H2O that you need, I can give that to you. I am the source. I can give that to you. And as the woman was trying to talk, she sends some spiritual things. And she's trying to reason out with God. And God said, I can quench your thirst. And I will give you the ultimate and essential satisfaction. Friends, that's what happened when we worship God. We will have ultimate satisfaction. And the woman replied, give me that water. Give me it. My friends, everything that has hurt you in the past is relational in nature. Everything that God is going to give you, everything that God wants to give you is relational in nature. You are defined, we are defined by our past relationship, but God wants to redefine you to his orig original identity by having a relationship with him in worship. Number two, creation. Let's, let's look at creation, uh, verse 7, part B. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, springs of water. You know, you ever, you ever uh, mess with Google Earth, Google Earth ma uh, app, you know, and you try to go up and down, go up and down. You know, they say that at 15 feet high in the air, you can get high resolutions of pictures. And at, what did they say, 12,000 feet, they can get an aerial coverage of of a certain region. So, so let's let's look at the let's look at the Earth. Okay, if if the dot of this pen is the Earth, okay, and this is the Sun, okay, and let's look at Jupiter, the biggest planet. Okay, so this is this is the Sun, this is the Earth, the dot of the pen, and this is Jupiter, the biggest planet. You know, you could put the earth, you could put 1.3 millions of earth that can fit into the sun. How big is that? That is so big. And yet, now if you look at, if you look at the sun, okay, with nine planets orbiting around the sun, and that is what we call the solar system, right? And that solar system, if you compare that with our galaxy, they said that in our galaxy alone, in the galaxy of, of Milky Way, there's 100 billion stars. The sun is just one of the 100 billion stars. Can you imagine that? Can our brain understand that? No way. And how many galaxies in the world, in the universe? There's 100 billion. That's conservative. That's what they have observed, observable um, stars in the universe. 100 billion stars just in our galaxy. Now, they say if you have, if you count the stars in the whole universe, all galaxies, the whole universe, there's one, one yottabyte of stars in the universe. Now, yottabyte is one, and you put 24 zeros. That's a lot of numbers. They say number is infinity, so that's a lot of numbers. That's how many stars in the universe, and yet, in Psalms 147, 4, he, he says, He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Can you imagine God naming all these hundred billion stars? That's just amazing. Friends, you look at creation. There's nothing you can do but worship. And yet, you look at the human bodies. It's so complex. You know, all the complexity, the DNA, the RNA, all the anatomy, physiology, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. And yet, Psalms 139, 14, it says, you are, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. And in fact, we are the only created ones that were made, molded by God's hands. 
And that makes us so special. So people refuse to believe in the existence of God, not because of scientific reason, but because they don't want accountability. They don't want morality. Okay, third, third uh, uh, line is uh, judgment. If you look at judgment, Revelation 14, 7a, it says, Fear God and give glory for the hour of his judgment has come. May 1, 2011, there was a big game of the Mets and Phillies. Now, this is a big rival, big rival team. It's kind of like Bears and Packers, you know. So there were like 40,000 in one stadium. They were playing. And um, so they were playing like this big game. It was just, you know, mon monumental game. And um, all of a sudden, people were looking at their phones. Everybody was texting everybody. Everybody was texting somebody. And so, you know what was the text everybody got? It says, Osama bin Laden killed. Everybody knew, except for the players. So, you know, it, it, the rumor started around 9.30, 9.45 in the evening. And then, so all of a sudden, everybody knows, except for the players. And so the players were like, what's going on, you know? All of a sudden, people start chanting, USA, USA. So they start chanting, and the, the players were like, what's going on? You know, even the Canadian players were like, you know, <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing? So all of a sudden, they realized, they were told by their coach that Osama bin Laden was killed. You know, in that scenario alone, there's two events that happen. There's a game, and there is judgment. All of a sudden, judgment, I mean, all of a sudden, the game has become insignificant. Because there is judgment that is going on. If you look at um, the rival fans, they hug each other. You know, they didn't talk before that, but after that, they start talking. They hug each other. Judgment, the, the incident of judgment has become celebrated. They have celebrated together. Everybody was joyful. Everybody was happy. So the question is, why is judgment important? Why do we need to talk about judgment? Because there is an accuser of the brethren. So an investigation is necessary prior to pronouncing a sentence. That's why we have this investigative judgment that is, that is very solely from the Adventist standpoint. And judgment is necessary for vindication of the righteous, vindication of God's character and glory. Friends, we need not to fear judgment because God is our judge. He is our defender and our mediator. You know, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says, Reason for judgment, it says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and expose the motives of man's heart. All at that time, each will receive his praises from God. Can you imagine that God is going to praise us? That is, you know, I don't know how to, I don't understand how that works. But anyway, it says the main motive of judgment is to expose man's heart. You know, Judgment, my friend, is not about keeping all the Ten Commandments perfectly. Judgment is not about keeping the right day. Judgment is trying to figure out where your heart is. If you come to the right day, right place, but your heart is not there, God is going to judge you. It has to come from the heart. On the other side, on the other flip side, if you look at um, any of you are members of a Planet Fitness Anybody goes to Planet Fitness here? Planet Fitness has been known to be judgment-free zone, right? You've seen this over and over again. No judgment whatsoever. However, if you sign up for Planet Fitness, you are going to sign up, you're going to sign your name that you are not going to do something that is inappropriate, something that they have judged inappropriate. So that's kind of ironic. But judgment-free doesn't mean rule free and there has to be a rule right or else everything would be chaotic so in minnesota in the minnesota crime report commission crime commission report it says if a child is permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his every child would grow up to be a criminal a thief a killer or a rapist my friends when we see how just god is it will compel us to worship because his judgment is just. 
Okay, I'm going to go to the fourth, fourth one. Redemption. Reason for worship is redemption. Revelation 14, 6. A. He had eternal gospel to carry around the world, throughout the world. So the question is, most people would ask you, when were you saved? You know, most people would say March or August 5, you know, 2018, you know. So that's, the, that's when people say, I was, I was, you know, I was, I was in the desert and God just hit me. You know, and that's, that's when I was saved. Now, of course, we always say God saved you when? When Christ died on the cross. Amen. All right? So, when did Jesus die? Anybody know the date when Jesus died? Okay, 33 AD. Okay. Now, 33 AD, that is when, what the historians would say. Okay? That is what history says. Jesus died on 33 AD. What does the Bible say? When did Jesus die? Let's look at Revelation 13, 8. It says, Lamb slain before the creation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. Okay? So that is when really when you were saved. If you really want to be biblical, you were not saved 2,000 years ago. You were saved before the foundation of the earth. Can you imagine that love? You know, it's like you have a boyfriend or a sweetheart, you know, and you're trying to date this, this, this person. And yet that person is already loving you way before time. I mean, that is God's love. God is ahead of the game before we even know it. That is love. This is amazing love. So what is the primary reason of redemption? Ephesians 1, six, the praise of his glorious grace. My friends, the reason for redemption is not for us. We, we benefited from the redemption of God, but the primary reason for redemption is for the glory and praise of God. We are not the center of salvation. Christ is the center of salvation. I always say this, redemption preceded creation. So there was, before creation, there was already redemption going on. So God's plan of redemption is to cleanse us from sin. At the root of every sin is false worship and idolatry. My friends, sin is breaking the heart of God. You're not breaking the Ten Commandments. You're breaking the heart of God. It is a common teaching that God died of a broken heart. And they have articles, you know, anatomy, physiology of how God, you know, was crucified. They said that Christ could have lived longer two to three days. But you know what? He did not die of wounds. He died of a broken heart. So how does this substitution, how does redemption work? How do we understand this glorious exchange of robes, you know, when God looks at the cross, what does God see? He sees you and me. When God looks at me, he sees Jesus. And that is how it works. John 12, 23, it says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And when we realize that the, the, the glory of God is the main reason for redemption, we cannot help ourselves but worship. I'm going to tell you the last story. We're going to be landing soon. Last story. Um, the reformers. The reformers uh, around 1500, 1600, the time of Martin Luther, when they are going to get, they march down the, march towards the place where they're going to get burned or hanged, these martyrs would sing, you know, and they would memorize verses. And um, so what the, what the torturers would do is they would put a, um, a tongue screw, and the tongue screw would clamp their lower jaw and inside their lower teeth. And so they clamp that, and then when the, when, the, when the people are getting tortured, they would sing, and then it wouldn't you know, make sense. It would sound funny. You, you, know, you can understand that. But you know, they were still doing that. And, you know, and when they were singing, more and more people are converted to the church because the seed of the mart the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church so my friend what a dedication and i hope one day we'll get to that dedication that even we face death we'll not be afraid to stand for jesus worship you know um and as we as we end this you know 
I hope that we could get a glimpse, you know, we just, like I said, we just barely scratched the surface. I hope we can get a glimpse of worshiping God from our hearts and not just out of show. And may we worship God in spirit and in truth. This is my prayer. Amen.